My name is Corey Blake, and I am the founder and CEO of Roundtable Companies. We support organizations and individuals on their emerging story, whether that be supporting them in writing the book they were born to write or culture shift, right, and how we actually package and grab onto the emerging story within our organization so that we can more quickly move into a future that we are desiring. Today, I am on Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, and we are going to get into vulnerability, right, the mechanics and awesomeness, the reciprocity of vulnerability and how we can use it in our lives to attract more of what we're after. We're gonna get into techniques behind that. We're gonna get into culture shift, into personal development, all the juicy grit of what it is to be a leader today. Congratulations, you are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Welcome, dear friends fans and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us here on Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips, part of the Full Monty interview series, where today we're going to ask, can vulnerability actually be sexy? <laughs> if you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go Full Monty. If you're a regular, big, nice, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast for Fortune 500 listeners globally. We're also honored and grateful to be cited by Inc. Magazine as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. GNA cited us in the top 10 podcasts for HR pros and managers too. So thank you to you for sharing the show with everybody that you know. Sincerely appreciate it. Remember, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please, please get over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, thanks for sharing the show with everybody. We really appreciate it. But let's let's get into the 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 big stuff here, okay? Watching and listening to this show, you're either a high-level executive, an entrepreneur, a sales leader, a leader in some capacity. And if you're a regular listener, regular viewer to this show, you've heard me speak a lot about the power of vulnerability. But maybe you're still not convinced, particularly when I ask. Can vulnerability be sexy? You might be screaming, hell no, as images of some poor guy curled up in a corner weeping come into your mind. Well, today, we are going to really challenge your concepts, our own ch whole concepts of vulnerability, what it is, and how badly we misunderstand it, and why it may indeed be one of your greatest assets. Our guest today is Mr. Corey Blake. Corey has been a storyteller for two decades, since he graduated from Milken University in 1996, so he's an old guy. Uh, working in Los Angeles for decades, Corey was the face and voice behind dozens of Fortune 500 and 100 brands. As the commercial voiceover actor, his work won Blendy, Addy, Cannes, London International Advertising Awards. Before working as a film producer and director at as an, and an author of award-winning publisher and a founder and president of Round Table Companies. He has an outstanding TED Talk, TEDx Talk, titled Vulnerability is Sexy. And you can also keep your eyes open for Corey's Addy Award-winning short documentary by the same name. Corey is the co-author of numerous books, including Edge, a leadership story finalist in 2008 for the National Best Book Award, and From Burrito to Boardroom, which is a finalist in 2012 International Book Award. Corey's projects have been profiled or showcased on New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Barron's, Wired, USA Today, NPR, Bloomberg. Nobody's ever heard of him, obviously. Corey is a member of the Young Entrepreneurs Council, the Stegen in Integral Leadership Academy, Black Belt Award recipient for leadership, and is a sponsor of Conscious Capitalism, a social venture network. He is a frequent speaker and facilitator. His passion is using storytelling to create epiphany experiences and identifying a shift in people and organizations. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Corey Blake. Woo! Yeah. Crowd goes wild. Yeah. 
<laughs> Thank you, Crowd Dave. goes wild. <laughs> well, welcome, Corey. And I want to jump right into this and talk about what was your first experience of realizing that this crazy thing called vulnerability could could even be considered sexy because it's uh, even the idea for particularly, I think, people over even 25, the vulnerability of sex is quite a foreign idea. When did it first occur to you that it might be sexy? So I didn't actually, um, I think, come up with the language around the sex appeal, but the first time that I felt it yeah. was back in about 2006. And I was actually working with one of the authors that you mentioned, um, Robert Renteria, who wrote From the Barrio to the Boardroom. And in our process, we find that people layer into vulnerability, right? So what they share at the beginning is different than what they share at three months, different than six months. And then at the ninth month, people start bringing out some of the stuff that they've never said out loud before. And in this case, Robert shared with me about a drug deal gone bad. He was in the middle of a cocaine deal, like suitcase full, big deal. And, and it, a guy, you know, pulled a gun on him and wanted, uh, wanted the drugs without giving him the money, pointed the gun in his face and pulled the trigger. And the gun just circumstantially lucky for him, obviously didn't fire. And he wow. bolted out the window and questioned his whole life at that point and decided I'm, I'm out of the drug game. Right. I can't so, imagine why. <laughs> why? Right. <laughs> but bless him. Right. So, so when I'm, when I'm, when I'm privileged to be someone that they're telling that to and saying it for the first time out loud, I feel so honored mm-hmm. to, to be the recipient of that kind of courage. And I think in that experience, hearing it with Robert and then seeing it play out time and time again with clients who are working on books with us, um, I noticed that for them, it's not sexy at all, right? No. It's horrifying. Like exactly. it's trembling. It's really uncomfortable. But to be in the presence of that kind of courage, it, it lights me up, right? It activates this deep, profound respect that I have for someone else. And I, I call it sexy. It's not sexual, no, but it is downright sexy. It's a it's a turn on about life. Yeah, but I think that that's a really great clarification that I want people to grasp is that it's not sexual. It's sexy, you know. And and I've I've actually brought this up with people before in a conversation where I said, you know, describe sexy, and you know, and 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 I'll say, but you can't, but you can't use a, a clarification or you can't use a a characterization of anything physical, Mm. right? And immediately people are stumped for a couple of seconds and then they go sense of humor or they'll go, you know, vulnerability, whatever it is, right? It's, it's that shifting out of attractive being physical to being something else. And that's why I really like the title, you know, vulnerability as, as being sexy because it really, I mean, for me, I think that it punches people in the face regarding concept concepts, about what vulnerability is, because, you know, even as I was saying in the beginning, when people think about vulnerability, particularly if they're my age or or close to my age, when they think about a guy particularly being vulnerable, they see this wimpy guy in a corner, you know, in a fetal position, weeping and blowing snot bubbles. And there's nothing sexy about that. But what you're talking about, for me, is actually the, the attractiveness that, quote, sexy, is in that the act of courage, that that pure act of courage. Walk us through how you get them to, you know, because I think that the thing that blocks us from that, that vulnerability very often, you know, as you talked about with that story with the cocaine, is that that person was probably feeling a lot of shame about what they'd done. They certainly can't conceive of that this is something that I should tell people because the judgment in their head is projected onto other people. So they go, well, I can't tell this. How do you get them over the shame to circumvent it, to go over it, go under it, whatever it is, so that they can really grasp that this could actually be profound epiphany for somebody reading it who's never been part of the drug world as the example? How do you get them through that? So there, there's two approaches that, that we utilize. And one of them is that we surround that individual with a team of non-judgmental individuals who understand what love is as a value. So how do I be with that person, right? And reflect back to them and hear them 
um, as a group. That's one component of it. The second component is, is that we grade into layers of less safety. So initially, right, um, we want to make the space incredibly safe for them to share. As trust is enhanced, they naturally want to probe deeper. And eventually they get, they get to that space where they start accessing things they've never said to themselves aloud or never even acknowledged as possible. Then that gets unearthed and that creates an opening for something that had never been considered before. So those two things in conjunction mm -hmm. are really key. Like sometimes, you know, we even refer to it as um, we surround someone with a team of artists who have rose colored glasses who can see the beauty in you, regardless of what it is you share. And over time, it's going to happen so frequently that you can't deny it. And you kind of have to eventually just accept that that is the version of you that is you. Yeah, but so I'm going to shift shift the tables a moment and go to the other side. So this person says, okay, you know, this has been wonderful. It's a marvelous experience. He's surrounding with me, me with all these rose colored glasses individuals, but now I got to go out into the freaking world and I got to be there with my book, with my, whatever it is. And the people on the other side of that book or, you know, in the audience are not likely to be wearing those glasses. How do you get them over that hurdle? Cause it's one thing to say, okay, here's the dry run. Here's the practice. But, you know, and now you've got a ton of courage because you're in front of us. But now we're going to put you into a, a potentially. Uh, what would be the right word? Not conflictual, but certainly rejecting. Dangerous. And, yeah. And feeling extreme danger, uh, feeling that whole survival shit come up for them. How do you get them to go to that? Because that's a different world. It is. Right? Rehearsal is very different from actually being on the stage. It is. So it, there's a natural process that, that I see happen that I'm fascinated by. There comes a point when they start to discount their team and their teams, uh, uh, the way that their team is, is able to view them. And it simply happens um, really organically. They yeah. come to a point where suddenly they say, um, you're paid. Now, I'm, you're, you're paid to like me. Exactly. <laughs> right? yeah. so they can discount that person. So we're very particular about the way in which people then take this version of themselves that they're, they've now got new language around their story and introduce it to the world. And so first, it's really important to go somewhere super safe. Oftentimes, that is a spouse or a life partner, could be even a parent, right, or a sibling. Someone who um, they feel like, I, okay, I can. I, this is uncomfortable, but I can hand it off. Mm -hmm. That person comes back and shares gratitude and says, oh my lord, I had no idea, thank you, I see myself in that, right? What's the most immediate thing that that client does they discount that person and cool. say, you're, you're my, you have, you're my, you love me. You have, yeah, you, to, love you, me. Have you have to, you have to be nice about this. So then we grade one step further, right? Into something that's a little bit less safe, which might be a close friend, right? Not necessarily relative. And they go through that process three or four times to eventually getting to a coworker or someone who feels like at the beginning would have been very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And when that person or people come back and respond and say, holy smokes, there's a confidence that builds each time. And eventually that person gets to a point where they go, just let it out there into the world for a couple of reasons. One of which I think which is really important is now they have a whole group of defenders. Yes. So if anyone comes against them, there are a whole bunch of people that mm -hmm. say, don't you dare. Mm -hmm. This is courage. This is risk, right? We will defend them with our lives kind of attitude. So yeah, it, it's not overnight. And I don't recommend that people just dive into it like a cannonball. You know, you got to, you've got to, you got to grade into it in a way that you can manage it. Yeah, I think that it's, <clears throat> I think part of it is social conditioning and that we, like I said, we've been told that vulnerability is weakness. We've been told that you should, you know, not air your dirty laundry. And one of the things I, I love about what Gary Vaynerchuk said is that the, the voyeur switch has been turned on in all of us with reality TV and Twitter and, you know, Snapchat and all those things. And even if you don't consider yourself a voyeur, that part of us has all been has been turned on. And he says, and there's a there's a plus and a minus to that. And and the minus to it is that you can feel like you have no privacy anymore. But the plus to it is if you think about that there's always a camera or a potential camera on you, you can step into your best version of yourself constantly as a reminder. But the the add-on to that is that you you can't deny where you've been because if you look, take a look at modern politics or even celebrity status, shit's coming out that didn't come out 30 years ago. You know, the, you know, the, the uh, 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 
a, a sexual predator who was a, who was a celebrity or a politician, you know, that was shoved under the rug for 30 years is suddenly coming to the surface. And, and there's only one way ahead of that, and that is for you to be the revealer. And I just Man. think that that's important. For, you know, as I remember uh, one of our programs. We, uh, we had a whole series of programs we delivered to the public. One of them was called Authentic Life Mastery. And it was the four quadrants of life, body, mind, emotion, and soul. And I talked about the depth of vulnerability that's important. And so one of the things we talked about was the use of drugs. And I said, are drugs bad? Asked everybody, are drugs bad? And of course, you know, a good percentage of the audience, oh, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, how do you know? You know, social conditioning, right? You know, we talked about the lies around it, uh, addiction that are misconcepts and what, what, what addiction is really all about. We had some really great insights and had people awaken to that they've been socially conditioned. And I said, and then I asked in the room, how many of you have done a drug? Right? And, you know, a few people in the room put, would be brave enough to put their hand up. And I said, first of all, you're all liars because everybody's done a drug. If you've, had, if you've had coffee, you've done drugs. If you've sure. had sugar, you've done drugs. If sugar was introduced today, it would be on the number one sub banned substance list. We know that. It's not, so it's a drug. And I said, but uh, let's talk about the drugs that are officially illegal. How many of you have done them? And, you know, and I admitted, yeah, I've done, I've tried lots of drugs. You know, don't do them anymore, but did certainly try them. Here's the thing, though, is... I said, and I said to the, to the audience, I said, now, here's the thing. You just had a judgment go off in your head. But I wonder how different, and I said, just whatever the judgment is, I want you to, in your mind, score it on a one to 10. Don't, you don't have to tell me, just write it down in your head or whatever, right? I said, okay. I said, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what your judgment would be if you heard that on TV, Barbara Walters is interviewing me, or you read that in a newspaper, what would your judgment be then? Would it be less or more? And every time it was more. They'd be more judgmental because there's a little bit of separation, right? But mm. when I'm the one who's vulnerable, the judgment goes down. And I said, so here's the deal. If Barbara Walters ever introduced me, interviews me and she's, you know, because she was famous for making people cry. And she said, you know, oh, here you are. You empower people. You do leadership. You work with people all over the world, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you did cocaine in the 80s, didn't you? And I would go, yes. And she would say, well, do you think that's a very good influence on people? No, never did it to influence people for the good. <laughs> that wasn't my intention. I was doing mm -hmm. it because I was having a good time. Um, do you still do it? No. Do you judge it? No. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's good. But I think you have to have a lot of discernment about these kinds of things. But I'm certainly not condemning or condoning. Mm. Immediately I go to that place, I've disarmed it. And I think this is the process that I'm really hearing from you, Corey, that I want people to grasp. Is this is... A, it disarms it to others and makes it so that other people can step into their courage and be, have that vulnerability. Am I on track here with how you, what you're doing? Yeah. So you, it reminds me, you talk about reciprocity in your book mm -hmm. and, and I find that, um, I didn't do it for this reason, but it's certainly an outcome that I constantly find is that when I am vulnerable, for example, on stage, there is a whole slew of people who feel the need to come up to me and share something incredibly personal because when I'm vulnerable, I shift things off balance, right? So for people, a certain percentage of people want yeah. to bring it back into balance Absolutely. and a certain percentage of people want to just be angry at me for putting them in that position, which is also totally understandable, sure. right? Because I'm, I'm, I, they didn't invite it, right. right? I didn't ask permission. I just created the lack of balance. So you're, 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 I think you're dead on target in the value of what happens when I initiate, I create an opportunity for those who are in alignment to want to come up and push up against and have their own experience ignited. And this is, you know, as you read in my book, I mean, this is one of the things that I think so, you know, we, we, I don't think we have a problem with employee retention. We don't have a problem with disengagement. We have a freaking crisis with it. Um, and I'm not talking about because of millennials. I'm talking about because people don't leave jobs. They leave bosses. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the, the people are so, many often leaders are, very often leaders are, have lost their humanity. And, you know, in my workshops and even in the platform when I'm speaking, I demonstrate that that vulnerability is such a powerful bonding experience that we miss it because we've made this, there's a world of who I am at home and there's the world of who I am at work. And that never, never shall the two meet. But the truth of the matter is, you're the same person. And, and 
bringing that here, which is what you're doing with the work that you're doing in people's books, and is, is saying, this is me. Nobody is a single faceted being. We are multifaceted. You know, we've all got skeletons in the closet. We've all got, so let's open the freaking closet. Let's just get it over with because then there is no surprises. You know, let's just talk about what you've done and realize, yeah, you know what, as you said, there's that reciprocity. But the other thing about it is I believe it's magnetic. And what I mean by that is it pulls people, certain people right to you, but just like a magnet, it repels other people away. And I can't think of a better system for finding the right people to surround yourself with as a human being and certainly as a leader. Absolutely, man. Like all the, all the wasted time, energy, and resources – right, that go into retaining the wrong people and the wrong relationships. I mean, there was, it was only five or six years ago that I feel like we were, 80% of our clientele was not quite the right fit. And we spent so much of our time pulling our hair out over those folks. And then eventually we said, what would happen if we say no to all those people and just make room for those who are right? And it freaked us out. It, I, I, you sure. know, fully, full admit, right? like we could really go in the hole for this. We could go bankrupt because of this decision. But very quickly we found that the space was filled up by the right people. And now I'd say we have like 95% alignment both internally and externally. It's not perfect, right? Because yeah. sometimes like sometimes I get sold in a way that's not necessarily like I find wake up one day and find out, oh, I, well, that was a good salesperson. Yeah, like, thought, they're not really strung up. That. That. Yeah. It's fine, right? Yeah. But to have so much alignment Right. It creates that kind of loyalty that you're talking about with our employees because they love the people that they work for sure. and each other. Right. Yeah. That deep sense of of emotion that comes from all of that. So to me, absolutely. It's a it is a game changing approach that focuses on the core centerpiece as opposed to all the symptom crap. Yeah. You know, you and I uh, in our previous conversation there was something that really came up that I think that we really need to talk about here, which is <clears throat> comfort people mm -hmm. so cling to the comfort um i I'm, i often quote uh may sarton i think her name was may sarton she said we die by comfort and we live by conflict which for me embodies the subject of genuine vulnerability because so often the conflict is actually with ourselves i know that in the work that you do comfort is the energy tell it uh, is the enemy tell, tell us more about what, what that is for you why comfort is the enemy because everybody's like looking for that comfortable place to fall. You know, uh, um, you're aware that I do this work at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. And I think yeah. that the, the way that they talk about it is resonating for me right now. When, um, when there's no resistance, right, when there's no pushback, things can feel, quote unquote, comfortable. Mm -hmm. But we are floppy. We're limp in life when there's no resistance. And that there's no growth in that. So it can feel fluidly comfortable, but there's no advancement. There's no risk required. Um, when we are pushing up against, when there's a fair amount of resistance, it lets us know who we are. It lets us know what our boundaries are. Mm -hmm. and, and it lets us push against them, right, and learn new things and increase our capacity, increase the scope of that bubble that the world is pushing up against. So to me, that's where life exists. Now, that can be dangerous. I can, I can be someone who gets so addicted to the resistance. Like I had this experience just a few weeks ago where I kind of stompled, uh, stampled over somebody. Mm -hmm. Not a word, but it is a word now. <laughs> right? Like I, st You're I, like I stampeded. That's what I was looking for. I stampeded over somebody because I was so desperate for that pushback, but I wasn't, I wasn't reading their ability to meet me there. Right. And they, they, they were not in a space to do that in the moment. So I have to be really careful with it. But it is the place that I feel most alive. And that's it's like another one. You know, I talk about my addictions. That kind of addiction to connection is also the addiction to pushback and finding people in my life that are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me. You know, there's an interesting piece there. Uh, in, in my work, one of the things I, I talk about is, you know, we'll be in a boardroom working with a team. This happened recently. <clears throat> and so we, it, we're working with a multi-generational family. So we've got dad who's the patriarch and then we've got his son who's, who's supposed to be in succession and we've got other board members or other executive team members in the room. <clears throat> and a meeting came up at the end of our training. So the two leaders, dad and his son, had to leave and we got to stay in the room with the execs. And we'd just gone through a four-hour training with them. And so I, I looked at these, these execs who were working very tight proximity with the father and son. And I said... Uh, 
how was that for you? They gave me their feedback. And I said, on a, on a, on a level of depth, what was that like? You know, tell us on, on a score of one to, to 10. And one of the guys said, well, you know, I'm the youngest, as in the, not been at the company, the long, the, I've been at the company the least amount of time. I've only been at the company three months. He goes, so for me, it felt like it was like a 10. It was pretty intense. And one of the other guys says, oh, it was definitely, an, you know, it was, I've been here a long time. It was a nine. And one of the other guys says, well, I've been here 20 years, and it was a 0.5. <laughs> and I said, no, so that's a, that's a big variance, right? And yeah. I said, so that's interesting. So tell me why it was a 0.5. And he said, because the amount of shit these two have got in their way that's impacting this company and the work that you're doing. He goes, don't, I'm not denying for a second. You've gone deeper than any consultant, any team we've ever had in here. You do an amazing work, but it's just skimming the surface of what's really there. And I, and I, then I asked the other guy who gave us an, uh, gave us a, a nine and, and what he said, and you know, but then I brought it back to this. And I, and I think this is to your point. I said, here's the deal. Is it courageous for me to get on a stage and speak to 5,000 people? And they went, yeah, I guess so. And I said, no, it's not. It's not. It, it's courageous for me the day before. But the day I step <laughs> onto that stage, there's nothing courageous at all. I love it. I, you know, it's a little bit diaper the day before. But the day of, it's, there's no courage involved. That's what I do. I'll step into that. I said, but would it be courageous for you? And they said, yep, it would be terrifying. I said, great. Now let me ask you this question. Is it terrifying for you to leap? Because one of these guys, the, the guy who said a 0.5, he runs construction development. I said, is it courageous for you to read a blueprint and then direct people where to go and what to do with that blueprint? And he goes, no. I said, would it be courageous for me? And he goes, I don't know. I go, oh, it would be terrifying. And I said, this is the thing that we all have to remember is courage is subjective, but we judge it on our own level and we project it onto others. And so there are things, and so I said, the thing about vulnerability is it has to have a reciprocity. Absolutely. But you can't judge it at your level. You have to judge it at the other person's level. Because for me, revealing that I didn't change my underwear this week might feel like, oh my God, that's so like, oh, so shameful. And for somebody else, for like for another version of me saying, you know, uh, I did drugs in the 80s, is terrifying. Which is more courageous? Well, it's not more, it's, it's to that person, the subjectivity. And it was really important what you were saying there about pushing against something because that's the part of our ego mind that says, well, this is more important. <laughs> you need to step in a bit more. No, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's your level of discomfort? Let's measure mm. that. Not against mine, but against yours. And I think this is where we get stuck with vulnerability because we go, well, I, I don't know if they were really vulnerable with me. And the question I think that people have to learn to ask is, is not the words, but to watch for the squirm. Watch for the squirm. That's it. The, the squirm factor. Because if the squirm factor is that oh, I parked illegally, and I'm like, what the hell? That's my reaction. Mm -hmm. But for that person who's incredibly rules-bound, it might be massive. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh it's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you. I, I, I think you're making a, a really profound and important point. And I'm watching it in my own work unfold because I'm doing a lot of speaking and I share vulnerably from the stage. Now, vulnerability that has been rehearsed loses its vulnerability. So I'm constantly figuring out how do I be authentic with the audience while also relying on the big pieces of my life that each time I share it with an audience, there's still a, certainly a level of vulnerability, but the squirm factor changes depending on, but, but that pushes me to access new learnings and unpack new things about the same situation so that I'm offering a new epiphany that's become available simply because I'm noticing my experience of sharing it differently. Yeah. But it's a, I, I hear you, you know, if it's not making our voice shake, then it, is it, you know, what, what, to what degree is it truly vulnerable? Yeah, it's, it's powerful. Tell us about, uh, because a lot of the work that you're doing now, uh, uh, you know, you, you've done work, you're doing a lot of corporate, but you've, a lot of your work has been translated into youth at risk. Tell us about that. That's not really for our corporate people, but I want them to get the power of this and where this can go, because this is being used with youth at risk. Tell us about that. Well, there's this, this natural thing that we've watched happen time and time again, and it's um, when people start sharing their own story, and it starts going out and impacting other people's lives. 
there tends, it's not always, not 100%, but there tends to be a desire to push down to younger ages. And I don't know if that's because we, you know, we do work with a lot of people who have children of their own. Of course. And suddenly they're having that moment of, well, what if I had learned this when I was younger? That would have changed my life. How do I support people who are younger? And it's not unusual that it turns out to be some kind of at-risk group, whether it is children with certain, you know, challenges, um, might be poverty related or gang related, might mm-hmm. be, you know, disabilities. Um, there's just a, you know, beautiful wide range. Um, kids who've lost a parent, like there's just all, all kinds of stuff that, that all challenges that children are dealing with. And there's just that natural tendency and, and it pushes down further because once a teacher starts taking that material and using it and starts pushing back and saying, you got to go even younger. Like it's not unusual that we'll do an adult book. We'll do a book for kids in high school and maybe middle school. And then we'll get teachers who inspire us to create a coloring book because they want to introduce the conversation of gangs and drugs to kids that are four and five years old. Fabulous. So they're that much more prepared down the road, right? Yeah. It's big stuff. I mean, I, I it's just, a, it, again, it's about following that energy out in the world and seeing where that leads. It, it's not something that we strategized. That's amazing. You know, I talked about in your introduction that you've been in the storytelling business for a couple of decades. And, and you know, one of the things that I'll say to people, you know, it, is tell me a story about you. That, that simple question can be profound. And people say, why do you start that way? And I said, well, because this, the oral tradition, storytelling, is, you know, it's as old as man. As long as we've been able to speak, that's what we've done. We've told stories. Tell us how you get people to access their stories. Because one of the things about stories, and you and I both know this because we stand on stage and we share stories. But one of the things about it is a very good friend of mine reminded me of this. Um, I was, I've been speaking for 34 years and there was a period of time there where I did not tell my story hmm. uh, because I was in front of another speaker and, and he said to me, listen, nobody gives a shit about your story. What they care about is what you can offer them. And he was very successful, like profoundly, like way beyond where I was ever at. And I was like, okay, I should listen to him. And I did. So I stopped telling my story. Now, was he right? Yes, he was right. But he was also wrong. So, Mm. But I stopped telling my story. I'm having a conversation with another friend of mine. And he said, how come you don't tell your story anymore? And it was exactly what you had said, Corey. It had lost its vulnerability. Mm. I was manufacturing the vulnerability. It, It was... Well, as I call it, faux vulnerability. It was. Sure. You know, it wasn't quite real. The story was real. The truth was in it. But the 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 feeling, as you said, of that that squirm factor just wasn't there. How do we have people understand that? Because we've also had people in front of us who tell stories, and we're like, "For God's sake, get to the king point." Right. So I think mm-hmm. that that's the other piece around stories. It's not just the vulnerability. It's like it's boring. Yeah. Right. So how do we get them to work that out? How do you assist people in in discovering how to not be a boring bum bag with one of those never ending fucking stories that makes everybody go to sleep versus a powerful story that connects people? Well, if if the storyteller um isn't having a, uh, a holy shit in unearthing the story, the audience isn't going to have one in hearing it, That's right? It. So, so many people approach their stories um, from their head. And our job is always how do we drop it down into the body where there's all this awesome wisdom and how do we help them access the stuff that they've been storing up? Um, and there are techniques you know, that we use that I, that I think are just so incredibly fascinating around... Um, uh, how do we how do we support people through reflection to to drop into deeper layers of understanding of themselves? Um, I mean that is a, you know those kinds of 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 techniques actually are super important to this kind of process, but they are they're all based in in listening. So give us right? one of those techniques so that our viewer, our listener can can have a sense of this for themselves because right now this is all very ethereal and it's conceptual. Sure. Give them, get, let's give people something they can go, okay, you know what? I like the idea of this, but I wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah. Where can I start? So, so it is a, it, to me, it's a process of noticing, 
um, and, 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 a, and an insatiable curiosity about what's going on with myself. Mm. So as an example, I'll share that um, when you started the question of, um, of you know, you're saying that usually you start off an interview by asking someone to tell their story, something to that degree, right? I'm listening and I'm with you. And at the same time, there's a whole narrative that exploded in my head, right? And I'm noticing, I'm just watching my, me, myself be present with you and watch this whole thing that's, that's manifesting in this internal dialogue. It's like meditation, right? I'm trying to bring myself back to the present, but I'm getting pulled away by a force. And, and I, there were a couple of different stories that I'm living with right now that are, that are pulling at me, that I'm still, I'm at a new layer of unpacking. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so the, the awareness of, um, noticing in my body what was happening to me, like I felt like, I felt like I was being pulled right back into like, I'm, I'm here and I'm present, but, but there was a weight, there was a, I don't know how to describe it other than a pull. So noticing that that's happening in my body. Mm -hmm. Right. And then noticing that there was one story that I felt like, okay, well I could share that one. And that's the right. Noticing like, okay, that doesn't change my breathing. That doesn't change. Like I'm not, my heartbeat doesn't go up. I was like, oh, and then there's this other one. And I feel like even that head twitch, like you see that? Like, yeah, I, that, like that's a little squirm factor right there. That's it. That's it. So, so a big piece of it is noticing that stuff. And I'm practiced at that, right? right? I know how to notice those things in myself. Most of our clients don't have that ability. So we do that for them and reflect it back. And I might say something like, as I hear that in you, I feel myself being pulled back in my chair. Mm -hmm. And that gives them an opportunity to say, oh, is that how I feel or do I feel something else? And they might try it on and go, holy smokes, yes. Like, yes, oh, there's this huge weight on my chest. And it just gives them access to a different access point, right, to to the story and to what it is that they're trying to unpack. So that noticing piece, and that's both me noticing what's happening in you as I'm present with you and what's happening with myself internally, offering it up as a piece of data and then not interpreting it. I'm not Mm -hmm. going to interpret what the weight means that I'm I'm being pulled back in my chair. I'm not going to give any extra explanation because that will deflate it. And you might just easily borrow my explanation because it's simple. Mm -hmm. But if I just shut up and I just say, man, when you said that I felt pulled back in my chair and then I zip it, chances are you'll go somewhere really dynamic. Yeah. One of, one of our teachings is, if you don't feel it, we can't hear it. Right. Bada that's, booyah, that, man. That, that, that's so what it's about. So let, for, for our listeners, for our viewers, let's, let's, let's go first of all to a high level executive, C-suite executive, you know, in a fortune 500 organization, for instance, mm-hmm. why the hell do I care about this? Like, this is all very nice. So what? What's that got to do with the fact that I got to reach the bottom line? I'm under pressure from the CEO or I am the CEO. I'm under pressure from the board. You know, this is all very nice. It's a bit ethereal. Uh, you know, okay, you say it does something, but why do I, why should I even care? And certainly, why should I even consider hiring Corey or Dove for that matter to, to help me with this kind of work? Because, you know, he, he, even as you listen to us, by the way, folks, as you're listening and watching this, you might be thinking, aren't these guys talking about the same thing? Aren't they competition? No, we're not competition. There's no such thing as competition. It's bullshit. It doesn't exist. What Corey does is Corey does, and, and it's brilliant. And what I do is what I do, and, it's, and it has its own merit. And we come at it in a slightly different way. But, yeah, we're still we're eliciting things from you that are important. And your pull towards somebody like me might be different than a, the pull towards somebody like Corey. But this is, I believe, it's vital work. But tell us why you believe that that C-suite, that, that executive, would give a shit. Because they're going, nice podcast, in the background, don't care. Yeah. Well, I, I have to be authentic and say, first off, somebody who is coming at it from that place, I'm not going to give any time to. Because the, the, I don't... I don't I don't convert those who don't want to be converted. It's just too much damn energy for me. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> that being said, um, my, my, you know, where I like to meet people is people who have cracked the door open, right? As opposed to they've got 17 locks on it that I have to somehow figure out how to get my way through. Forget it. But, <laughs> but I love the question. Right. And I think, you know, we're, we're working with um, a publicly traded company right now that um, is, it's unusual, I see, right? Because 
the, the more that the boards grow and you have, you know, stockholders in this or that vulnerability becomes, it's just that much more distant as a mm-hmm. possibility is typically what I see. Yeah. I happen to be working with an incredibly courageous CEO right now who has a board who doesn't buy into this and who has a thousand employees who are just being introduced to it. Her leadership team, she has been investing in their understanding of this stuff for a few years. And, and it's, and there's 16 people sandwiched between a board and a thousand employees, right? The courage that it takes to do this work, knowing that it's uncomfortable for everyone around them is awesome. Oh yeah. But I think what I see is in the absence of this work, you've got 16 people who are going to try to pull a thousand people in their direction. But by going through this work, we're going to create a workforce of a thousand people who are pushing from the bottom or the top, or however you view the pyramid, however it works, right? They're pushing so that the people who are in that leadership position, they can take that energy and fly into whatever is next. And that is an awesome opening for the company. And it's such a different perspective than what I see most CEOs, they're just spending all day pulling other people along. And it's Mm -hmm. an exhausting energy. It doesn't serve the organization. And when you get into the difference between wasteful, you know, energy and energy that that pushes in the right direction, when you get everyone rowing or pulling the rope in the same direction, whatever metaphor you want to use, life is different for that organization. And that means that results can be completely different. They can be stratospherically different. Now, I realize that's also totally anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Right. It's also I work off of the energy. I'm not a scientist. You know, I'm not Brene Brown looks at vulnerability from a data standpoint like that is her her place. I, I come at it right from that internal experience. Mm-hmm. And but what I see when people are in that transformational space, when you can shift one person and then shift the team and then shift the company. What becomes possible, the opportunities are you could never strategize, you can never plan for, you can't create as goals, but man, they are profound and awesome. Yeah, again, there's like we talked about earlier, there's this wonderful collective reciprocity too. Uh, And as I said, I think it does, it's magnetic. It pulls people in, but it also repels the wrong people away. And we can't, you know, often people will say, you know, I'm going to bring you in because we need to build loyalty. And I say, listen, we will definitely build loyalty. You're going to have people who stick around more than they've ever stuck in around. You're going to have greater engagement, all those kinds of things. But you have to know we are going to learn some. Fo- we're going to lose some folks because it's a magnetic, and magnetic both attracts and repels. And if you can't go there, you're going to go. This shit's. This is bullshit. I'm out of here. <laughs> right. It, it, it is such an awesome opportunity because the way that we meet those people who need to leave, right, is a whole other uh, invitation into deeper loyalty. Yeah. When the people who are staying watch us treat those people with grace and kindness and support them in what's next and celebrate the contributions they've made to date, holy smokes, the people who are already loyal, man, they just they, they feel that much safer. Absolutely. That's a huge game changer for people. Absolutely. The Let's talk about this at, at, at one level deeper, which is the impact on corporate culture. Because mm-hmm. it's one thing to 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 get the the the, uh, the executive team to get the CEO and the executive team involved, which you do and I do. But then there's like, talk to us about what you've seen as the impact on a culture, because this is not your usual HR thing. And of course, there's a great deal of nervousness when I talk about this. A great deal of nervousness around the idea of oh, this could set us up for all kinds of litigation because people are revealing shit that they're not supposed to be talking about and they're very, you know, we got legal things to think about. Talk to us, I want you to share with our audience what you've seen as the impact on a culture when this is embraced, when vulnerability is embraced. Yeah, um, it's it's often uh, create, it often creates a freak out initially. Yeah. Uh, right. And some serious legitimate panic from people. Sure. Um, and then there's this, this moment, um, where people experientially see the value. Mm-hmm. I don't think I ever see people make sense of the value only, only in a physical interaction, right? Can it be proven where someone can, can have that collision with the old story they're telling, which is that this is a bunch of BS. It's going to 
be horrible for me yeah. with the new story of, oh my God, this felt really good. And right. I feel seen and I feel kind of powerful right now. Right. Ooh, right. Um, so that's what the, that's what the opportunity is, is that moment of collision where we rewrite the old story. Yeah. But it only becomes available um, when we watch, and this is in my experience, when we watch leadership um, show up when it's most inconvenient in alignment with what they say. So whoa, 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 stop, 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 whoa, whoa. Say that again. That was <laughs> powerful. So leadership has to show up when it is inconvenient and do so in alignment with the values that they've been speaking. I really hope you, dear listener, viewer, got that. Because leadership is not a freaking position or a title. One more time, Corey, and then I'm going to let you keep going. Because that is yeah, like, no worries. <laughs> right? We have to show up when it's inconvenient. And we have to adhere to our values in that moment. In the absence of that, if they see us throw away our values because it's too much of a hassle, forget it. We've actually created more damage at the organization than had we not started this work at all. So that is, and that is absolutely, I mean, you hit it. It's, it's a crux of the work because yeah. that is actually where most leaders really um, lose, their, lose their people mm -hmm. is that they chuck it aside because it's inconvenient. Um, and it truly is inconvenient. Right. Like, so, so love is a value at our organization. Like, and the way that it shows up is I have to be present with people. That's a way that I exhibit love. And I have to, um, I, my goal is to, if I get triggered by something, by a circumstance with a client, let's say my goal is to figure out how do I work through the, whatever that trigger is so I can show up and meet that, that client from a place of leading with love. It's not always easy. Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes time. Right. And sometimes we've got every justification in the world for why we should push up against that client, not from a place of love. They might've acted like a total a-hole. Exactly. Like they've got it coming, right? Yeah. And, and no one would hold it against me if I let them have it. But that's precisely when we have to say, no, we have a true north here. And that means I have to show up a certain way. And you know what? I had a calendar that was full today and a lot of stuff that I'm excited to do. And this is not one of those things that I'm excited to do in the moment. It's a distraction, mm -hmm. it's inconvenient. And yet we have this value and that value says, I got to potentially make 90 minutes available during my day to day to talk to my employees who were treated like crap by a client to, to be there, to hear them and to support them in resolving the issue. Talk about inconvenience. And I mean, it's seriously 90 minutes out of your day when you were packed right. and you got to push things off and whatever. But the experience of doing that and showing up for those staff members and helping them feel heard. And then saying, I totally get it. I get why you would never want to work with this client again. So what do you guys want to do from here? Right. And for them to say, you know what? We want to say exactly what we were able to just say to you, to the client, and see what the possible result could be. They go away. They do that. The client says, oh, my God, I had no idea that this is the way that we were coming off. We don't want to treat you that way. We respect your team. We want to stay on this journey. And suddenly, not only have they resolved – They've, they've reinvigorated the project with honesty and truth yeah. and saved our team from, I don't know, 100 to 150 hours of bringing in other people, catching them up, like countless yeah. wasted resources, right? So what felt inconvenient in the moment was convenient in the long run by far, but I have to be willing to slow down, take a breath, look at the values and go, what is demanded by that regardless of how it impacts my day. And that is absolutely the point that most people say, screw it. I don't have time. I'm too busy with my head down and they throw the value to the side and that damages the culture. Fabulous. I believe it's not the truth. And I was pre-framed by saying this, not the truth. It's something I believe, but I believe in the years and years of doing what I do and watching incredibly successful people like yourself, um, people who are, uh, out on the on the outer edge, um, and that's not always in the financial bracket, but they're doing things that are profoundly impactful. Um, my experience is that every one of those people is obsessed. Every single one of them, uh, you know, my hand is up to obsessed, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean that there's something that if it's in a movie, it's the part of the movie they have to talk about. If there's an article, they have to read it. If there's a book, they have to read it. Uh, if it comes up in a conversation that maybe seems inappropriate for the venue that they're in, 
they can't help but jump back in it. You are a highly successful individual at what you do. You're an outstanding world class at what you do. Everybody knows that who knows you. What are you obsessed with? <laughs> it changes <laughs> about every two years. And actually, that's probably shorter as I get older. Um, and it drives my company crazy, by the way, because it means I veer off in directions. They have to figure out how to monetize Corey's new obsession. Um, but uh, for me lately, it is, um, it is the emerging – it's a couple things. The emerging story at the organizational level I find so absolutely – fascinating. Um, and it is, it is individual team organizational story. How does it manifest in those three different ways and how, how can we unpack the truth and essence of what wants to emerge in a way that expedites its emergence? Mm -hmm. Um, so how do I, so like, I love going into an organization and helping them articulate the values that come from their pain and their guts right? It's not clever. It's not insightful. It's not BS to hang on the wall. It's stuff that, man, it is, it is in their sinew and they never talk about it, right? But when we unearth that, they have this initial moment of, wait, these are going to be our values. And then they have this eventual moment of, oh my God, this is what drives each of us every single day. Mm -hmm. And we can harness this. Holy smokes, we can harness this. Not only in terms of the culture, but in terms of we can then ask the question, what have we been built for, yes. which might be different than what we're doing. Yes. Right. So I'm absolutely certainly fast. You can feel my energy around that. And I kind of feel some intensity coming back from you, <laughs> which I which I love. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece that I've been fascinated with for a long time that still is always present with me is that artistic articulation. Like how do we not only take um, what it is at the essence of an individual team or organization, but how do we amplify it through art so that pe other people can feel it in their guts too and see themselves in those stories so they can become part of the tribe because they've been emotionally just socked. I, I just love it. I love it. I certainly, I can relate. <laughs> Yeah. Just a yeah. smidge. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> I think you'd agree that leaders, real leaders, are committed to ongoing growth and development in themselves, in their organizations. What is an area that you are currently working on with yourself or with your business? Um. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to go pretty intense and then, um, and then I integrate. So I'm actually in an integration period mm -hmm. right now. Um, the intensity that I did, you know, I, I studied for 18 months at the Gestalt Institute at the same time that I did the Stegen leadership program. Right. Stegen is for me was more about productivity and more traditional leadership management stuff. Really useful. Cause I'm not an inherent business guy. I'm a, I have a theater degree. Right, so that was bad. Right. And at the same time, the Gestalt work is the deep human stuff of life. Um, and I graduated from both of those a little bit over a year ago. Mm -hmm. So so there's been a period of integration. And at the same time, I have been bringing my team and other leaders into the Gestalt world while I'm still remaining con in contact with the Stegen world. Um, my, our team, our leadership team of 12 will be at the Gestalt Institute. We've already been once, we'll be twice more this year. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is to fully support them in their own personal development and mm -hmm. to support them in doing it with each other as a dynamic team. Right. So we can then figure out how do we, how do we push this further down into the organization? Um, and I'm bringing, uh, other leaders, right? We've uh, twice, we've taken 12 other CEOs into that space to support them in their journey. So I am right. So, so now I'm in that space of how do I share this stuff that's been so meaty for me. Um, and I think the, the risks that I'm, that I'm taking or the personal development that I am engaged in is really around what I'm doing on stage and through facilitation. It's never the same, right? It's always evolving intensely for me right now. Um, while I'm in that period of figuring out what works best in different configurations and whatnot. So I'm in the push pull of that. And sometimes I feel like a genius and sometimes I feel like a hack, mm -hmm. but that space for me, um, is certainly a real strong growing edge 
learning exactly how much time do I need. Like, that's a big thing. The difference between 60 and 75 minutes is like huge for me right now, right? So knowing what do I, what boundaries do I have to set in order to show up with the greatest piece of me that there is to offer? Mm -hmm. How do I need to take care of myself in the midst of that, which these are lessons I'm having to learn that I didn't have to yet. Like I'm, I'm amidst all the challenges you get when you, when, when the world shows up and conspires in your favor and finally gives you the thing that you've wanted. Like it's this awesome blessing, right? And there's real challenge to of figure course. out how do I not get, you know, how do I not upset my wife from all of this travel? How do I really <laughs> be in it with her and, sure. and family with health stuff and like all that real stuff. So that's been a big growing edge for me and I'm also at the same time looking out for what's the next rich programmatic piece that I'm going to immerse myself in for a year or more and I, I'm looking for it I don't I'm not positive what that piece is yet but it's coming very cool very cool so what's the one thing you only get one and obviously it can't be long what's the one thing you want on your gravestone uh, by the way folks I don't prepare my guests for any of these questions. <laughs> that's, why they, that's why they look like they've just been slapped with a cod. <laughs> you know what's coming to me right now is just one word in quotations. Mattered. Mattered. Very cool. Mm. Very cool. If um, Let's imagine that I'm a high-level CEO, C-suite individual, an entrepreneur, high-level whatever it is. And I've watched, listened to this show, been intrigued by what you've talked about. And I'm asking myself, why would I engage Corey or Corey's organization? What is the answer to that? Uh, if you can feel that there's more, right? If you if you can tell that there's that there's something that's emerging, um, if you are if you feel stuck. If you, right, like so many of our clients have built a successful organization, but it's not enough. The financial mm -hmm. component is simply not enough. They want to matter more. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to do it in a way that is is authentic to themselves as a human being, not just a good idea, right? Not just some manufactured cause, but something that would be something that's bigger than them that they can't say no to once they really get their hands around it. Because otherwise we will, right? The fear will become too great at some point unless it's bigger than us. Right. Um, that individual um, is oftentimes looking for a shepherd. Sometimes it's a Del Baron. Sometimes it's a Corey Blake, right? And round table. But if they're in a space where um, where they want that, I have found cannot do it alone. I certainly can't. No, no way. Absolutely. I have got to have guides, right? You got to. I got to have people that are that are providing that push up against me that and willing to be authentic and and willing to unsettle me yeah. right authentically with what they see and so that's if that's what someone's looking for we provide one of those outlets please tell our viewers our listeners where they can find out more about you and what it is that you offer and all of your wonderful resources they can certainly poke around roundtablecompanies.com it's companies with an ies we are not a pizza company contrary to popular belief sometimes <laughs> i still get brochures from restaurant tours in the mail uh, roundtablecompanies.com has a ton of info around our book writing process, but also around the culture change work that we're doing, the art that we create at conferences and my keynotes, um, and the other speakers that are affiliated with our company. So poke around and have a good time. It's a fun site. Well, it's been awesome having you here, Corey. I knew that you and I would have a great time and it's really been awesome. And you know, I, I just think there's so much depth here for people to dig into and, and you know challenge themselves and i really do hope that they you know i say this to all every show at the end of every show please don't just listen to this i realize podcasts play in the background some of you are watching it but you're doing other shit too listen pay attention there is such great value here that, that Corey shared with you and i really want to challenge you to take him up on what he's talked about put it in action try it out Reach out to me. You can find me. I'll give you my private email, dov at dovbaron.com. You can, you know, so of course, rate, review, subscribe to the show, leave your comments, your feedback. But you can also reach out to Corey. Find him. Go to his website. Find him. Write to him. Tell him the impact of what you've learned from him today. The guy's given up an hour of his time to be with you and share his wisdom, his knowledge, and he's graciously given that to you. Please do not 
in any way undervalue that, respect that. Listen, as Corey said just a couple of seconds ago, none of us get to do it alone. And anybody who tells you they did is full of shit. There's no such thing. The self-made person is a liar. Every one of us had a hand up or a leg up from somebody. And if you're smart, you find the right people to help you with that. And Corey is certainly one of those people. So I hope you'll stay with us to the end, Corey, while we say goodbye to everybody else. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies is quite counterintuitive. In fact, some of the fastest growing companies are often hitting a point where they realize that they're spending a fortune on attracting, training, and developing talent, but they also have an alarming employee turnover. If you're sick of investing in getting the right people and training them, only have them leave you within a year or two before, before you've had a chance to get a return on investment, then talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets within your organization. As the research, as a result rather of the, this work, you can sincerely reduce your turnover rate by as much as 20 to 80 percent in as little as 120 days, thus evaporating those horrendous costs and stopping wasting time. FullMontyLeadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills that get you and your organization to the top and keep you there because you can't outsource authenticity. Till next time, this is Dov Barron, FullMontyLeadership.com. Remember to get over to Matrix.FullMontyLeadership.com, Matrix like the movie, Matrix.FullMontyLeadership.com, where you can go through your five-part self-assessment on finding out where your strengths lie as an authentic leader. Till next time, this is Dov Barron. Stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about the power of your own vulnerability.